for my benefit, what's, what is a futurist and how, how did you get into this? I mean, futurism is an old discipline. I mean, it's been around since the Cold War, really. And it really started with trying to break people out of the today mindset and think about future possibilities. Because the future is always different to what we expect. And if you can start to imagine it, you can start to prepare for it. Mm. So a bunch of people thinking about you know, post-Cold War possibilities sat around telling each other stories, science fiction, basically, about what might happen. And over the last 50, 60 years, the process has been refined, and now we use different tools to you know, imagine the range of possibilities for the distant future and bring that back to looking at trends and pressures that influence the near future. So if somebody comes to me and says, yeah, we've just had a nasty shock, we didn't see this coming, how do we avoid that happening again? Sure. I'll help them build processes or do the work for them to try and scan the near horizon. And if they come to me and say, look, we... we don't know what our mission should be. We don't know, you know, what's going to the few long term is going to bring. Where should we be putting our investment? Where should we be focusing our moonshots? We'll explore the range of possibilities for the far future. And then, as I say, that always naturally brings back another question, which is right: well, what do we do next? Yes. And so I get involved in innovation and organisational change, and you know, and all of that. And, and really, it's, it's a lifelong passion for me. You know, at the age of the age of three, my mum bought me the Usborne Book of the Future. Um, oh, I remember these. Yes, brilliant. The illustrated guide to the year 2000 and beyond, which gives you a clue to my age. And, uh, and I've been obsessed with it ever since. So you know, 10 years ago, I, a, a hobby became a, became a full-time profession. And it's, it's been an amazing journey ever since, working with an incredible range of businesses. You raised something interesting there about change. And some people are excited by change. Some people are naturally quite wary. And in my experience is, um, Businesses might be wary about change, but they also understand how difficult it can mm. actually be. You know, there, are, there can be changes in processes, there can be changes in data, but it's, that, um, it's the changing culture that's actually often quite difficult. So talk to me a little bit more about that because that's not, that's not actually easier, you know, so. No, you're right, I mean, and, and I think, if you, you know, look at us as kids, right? We're excited by change, mm. we're excited by the new, we're neophiles, everything new and things we can learn is exciting. You know, I look at my kids and they're just sponges, hungry for soaking up new information and new experiences. And somehow, at some point in our lives, that changes and we start to become a bit fearful. Mm. We start to rely on our established knowledge. We've got, become quite defensive of our egos, actually. It's like, I've built my career based on what I know. I'm not keen to go into a world where actually I'm uncertain again. And that's entirely understandable because so often the change in business is negative. It's you know, restructuring, mm. it's that sense of fear, that, that being forced to step out of your comfort zone. And for me, there's, there's, a, there's a culture change required in business now because we can't rely on our established knowledge anymore. Yes. Actually, you know, how long that established or how far that established knowledge will take you is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. You look at the turnover of companies on the stock markets, you look at the, you know, the, the length of time any CEO stays in place, they're all getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And so what we have to do is say to people, look, what we value you for is not necessarily the knowledge you've brought to date. Mm -hmm. It's your ability to acquire new knowledge, to change and adapt. And we should make this rewarding, we should make it exciting, we should make it fun. And we should accept that actually, there probably isn't somebody else we can bring in who's got the knowledge we want. We're trying to create new knowledge all the time. Mm. And so, so many of our organizations need to shift their focus from, okay, we don't have the knowledge we need, let's bring it in, to we've got this brilliant set of people who are passionate about the business, let's train them up, make it exciting, and, and give us the skills that we need for the future. Because we can't bring them in, there aren't enough graduates, there aren't enough people, we know this in the finance sector. Yeah, you know, we just don't have those resources to just bring in and, and solve the problems we have. And I think you've touched on the next next area that I'd like to move to there. So you've you've been working with us on this research piece for construction. Now we all know how dynamic this is. You know, I've come in on the train this morning from the south coast and I am seeing by the lines new plots, areas of land getting hived off. We need more houses. This is constantly in the news. It's a very dynamic sector, obviously, but we know it's very challenged. So talk to us a bit about some of the work that you've done in these areas and how you see where construction is now and, you know, and also what's a realistic time frame to look forward? Are, we, are, you, are you thinking about three years, five mm. years, ten? 
more. I mean, construction is particularly challenging when you look into the future because you're trying to build things that are still going to be useful, valuable and sustainable in 20, 30, 40, yes. 50 years time. And one of the most common questions I get in the, in the construction industry or from property developers you know, or investors is, what should I be building today that's still going to be valuable in that period? Uh, and the only answer is build something adaptable, you know, build mm. something that can change, build something to future standards, but something that can change. But even just building it is a problem. You know, we have a, a construction industry that is facing some very serious challenges and there are some short-term challenges. We've seen the prices of some raw materials spike by up to 120% yep. over the last year. We've seen you know, big issues in terms of supply and we've got this big issue in terms of skills and it's something that you know, the accounting sector and, and actually the construction sector have in common. We've got you know, ageing populations, ageing workforces in both areas. If you look at the membership of the major accounting professional bodies, you know, most of them, the average age is over 45, or the majority of members are over 45. Indeed. In one of them, the majority of members are over 55. Right. So, you know, we've got this, with this aging population, a third of um, companies in professional services and finance say they're struggling to recruit. Um, and then, you, you know, you parallel that into construction, and something like 44% of the site workforce are over 45, and the majority of under 35s are not born in the UK. Yes. So we're not, we don't have a domestic you know, new workforce coming in and we have you know, a workforce that is ageing. And I think the shortage is over 200,000 people we need to build the homes, we need to build the infrastructure we need. 200,000 people missing from the construction industry. So really interesting parallels between finance and construction there in terms of this shortage of, of people. So Tom. We've talked in general about construction for, and, and, and well from an operational side because I think that's why we're all in this. Mm. You know, we love seeing things get built. That's the, that's the exciting and the dy dynamic part of construction. But if we, if we focus this more on finance now, I mean, what, what, trends and chal well, what challenges and then trends do you see facing the Office of Finance in the, in the short and then in the mid and then long term? What's your feelings on that? I think that 80-20 that split of, of, of rear view mirror and, and future presents a big risk to the Office of Finance in some ways because it is the 80% that, that can be more automated. Mm. You know, and if you look at some of the technologies coming in that might advance our current position, we've got very good at starting to collect data, make data more transparent, start to automate some of the reporting processes, yep. take some of that burden off the, these incredibly bright people in finance who could be more focused on the future and release some time. You then bring in new technologies coming in. So um, you look at blockchain, okay? Naturally, a lot of skepticism around cryptocurrencies. I share it. Okay. But the underlying principle of blockchain, which is let's make transactions transparent. Let's, you know, so we've got this shared view of the world. And you know, you, even if you don't apply that technology, if you apply that view to the construction sector, so you get suddenly this transparency through your supply chain, this transparency through your assets, this transparency through your workforce, where you yes. can start to pull all that data into the Office of Finance, if it is still the Office of Finance, and do that analysis and do that reporting, whether it is on your, your classic financial reports or actually your ESG responsibilities, you, you can see that 80% time shrinking. You can see the amount of time that you have to spend manually dragging stuff into Excel. And it still blows my mind that that is still you know, every FD, CFO, fp &A person I speak to still far too much of their time drowning under a weight of exactly. interconnected spreadsheets that were built by somebody five years ago who's long since left and no one really understands but everyone's too afraid to change in case they break them. It's still far too much time. <laughs> so that shrinks and then you've got this strategy piece and you look at that and you say well if finance doesn't start those conversations operations, if finance leaders don't start growing that strategy role, taking themselves out into the business. I think the strategy role and actually the business partnering role, mm. you know, what you talked about, getting your feet dirty. If they don't start to take on that role, what happens to the Office of Finance, whether it's in construction or anywhere else then? And you have to say, well, actually, it could kind of cease to exist. 
you know, it doesn't it doesn't have to continue. There's no obligation once you automate a lot of that manual processing that you need to call that finance anymore. That could be subsumed into operations. It could be subsumed into the office of the chief exec. Yes. And then it's you know, that strategy beast maybe gets hived off in its own right. Maybe you have a dedicated data person you know, whose responsibility is the processing, the transparency, the, the validation and verification of this data. So I think, yeah, I think there's, there's huge opportunities for the Office of Finance there to, to, to grasp these automation technologies with both hands, partly because it makes their role more exciting and they get to exercise that brain more focused on the future, partly actually going back to our skills conversation, because I think it makes recruitment easier. Yes. You are building a finance function that is applying the latest technologies, then you know, you're, you've got a, and, and doing you know, this sort of exciting strategic business partnering analysis role, you've got a better chance of recruiting the greatest people. And that, becomes, that only becomes more true as we fast forward into sort of the next set of technologies. You look at you know, the, the, and they're, they're still very much theoretical at the moment, but the possibilities of quantum computing. Yes, indeed. Where, you know, where suddenly our bandwidth to process enormous quantities of unstructured data and extract insight and value, and actually, you know, my obsessions of futurist foresight out of it becomes you know amplified. I think that's really, really exciting. And so, you know, the difference between you know going to a field of, of graduates and saying you know come and drown in Excel for a few years versus it's rather come, unappealing, right? Or come and use a quantum computer to help us see the future. Yes, it's a very different proposition. So I think there's enormous opportunity for the Office of Finance to become this advanced, data-centric, strategic business partner that is both you know, helping to solve problems and answer questions across the business today and foresee the potential for the business tomorrow. And this is, you know, coming back to construction, you know, nowhere is that capability more important when you're, you know, when you're operating on wafer thin margins. I mean, the UK has the, the worst margins in construction on, at the large scale of any major market. Yes. You know, when you're operating at three, four percent, one big project can bring you down for the year. Indeed. So you want not just insight into what has happened, you want foresight into what's going to happen so you can drive those better margins out and drive those ESG goals not just at a company level but at an, at an individual project level and for me that's a really exciting potential future for the office of finance mm. taking that established skill base shifting the balance from 80 20 not necessarily to 20 80 but much more towards the foresight piece and then leveraging these new technologies like quantum computing like machine learning you know like advanced analytics and potentially something like blockchain to provide the data that feeds those capabilities in the future. Those technologies excite me, all these possibilities excite me, but I'm never quite sure where companies are at on that sort of adoption curve in terms of today and sure. even their, their enthusiasm for the future. You have those conversations and you know, in terms of the technology we talked about in the ebook, in terms of the, the today technologies, actually those, those tomorrow technologies, you know, what sense do you get from the customers you're having conversations with about where they're at on that sort of adoption cycle? Are they leaping onto these sort of advanced analytics capabilities today and do they have a view into the future of, of what might be possible? The, the thing that we're finding at the moment, in, in truth, is that where businesses suffer because of the, uh, the, the explosion of data is that there is a big link at the moment between the volume of data, the speed at which they can process it, and the speed at which they can turn it into a decision. Mm. There's, that, there's that big link. And we're right on the cusp of technology breaking that link now. You know, databases are there, connectivity is there, and that technology exists now where you can effectively break that link. And once you do that, for me, that's the single biggest turnkey to turning that 80-20. It'll never be 20-80. Mm. But if it becomes 50-50, that is a quantum leap forward for the business. And as you say, then you start turning the finance person from being somebody that looks at the past to somebody that's driving the future. That, that's what's exciting. That's what's going to engage people to want to come and join finance. So, I mean, that, that, that's my perspective mm. for, very much from a, from a tech point. I think... There's always, a, there's always a range. There's always your early adopters and your, and your, yes. your, your late adopters. I share your position that actually there's a lot of enthusiasm there, but I don't always necessarily the sort of the, the political sponsorship for investment in, in the Office of Finance. And it's funny because you know, finance used to own IT. 
you know, Indeed. the IT function emerged out of finance, but perhaps it's lost some of the political capital it had in recent years to, to bring that investment, to bring that support, particularly the sort of fundamental transformation we're talking about and the change of role we're talking about. And so, you know, while, you know, I do, I agree there's that sort of recognition of the value of data and the, and the desire to extract value from it. Mm. I don't always know that there's the, the coalition, the political coalition inside the C-suite to actually go and make those sort of transformative investments. Let me throw something out to you. Put yourself in a, put yourself in a boardroom. Mm. You've got a CEO, CFO, CIO, CTO, head of HR, everybody. How do you, how, what's the provocative thing you say? They're, they're, you, you want their attention. You want to really make a statement. What are you leading with? Yeah, you know, it's not an unusual situation for me. Yeah. Um, I have, you know, have caused a good few seconds of silence in boardrooms in the past. But it depends who I'm talking to. If I'm talking about the whole business, I mean, sometimes you have to say, look, you're without a, a, a quantum leap in agility and innovation. Your business isn't going to be here. But then if I look at the individual roles around the room and I look at the CFO, and it's something we put in the ebook, do we see the CFO as we know it still there in five years' time? Indeed. And, and I mean that both in does the role exist at all or do those components get sub sub subsumed into other parts of the business? Or actually, is the CFO root, is the CFO skill set, the training, still important in a few years' time? You know, when we have got this array of statistical and analytical tools, when we've got people augmented by AI and machine learning, when you have this sort of you know, quantum computing power underpinning, underpinning your foresight analysis, do we have you know, a CEO with a finance background? Or do we have someone who's primarily a coder or a communicator or a strategist, yes. a, an executive? And I think you know, in some ways, we may be seeing the roots of that today. I don't know what your experience is, but you know, when, you, when you talk to CFOs, they're quite often coming from a variety of different backgrounds and bringing different skill sets into the role. Oh, 100 percent. And you know, if we're talking about provocative statements, here's, <laughs> here's my one. I think the best CFOs I've ever met are business people first and accountants second. Mm. They put people in charge of the, the numbers, the bean counting, all of that, the tax, the compliance, the reporting, and they focus on engaging with the business, they focus on engaging with the markets, they focus on, in, on engaging with the CEO, shaping what's happening there, not being led, but mm -hmm. actually being an equal partner. Because I think it, it, very traditionally 20 years ago, as, as I was going, coming through accounting, the CFO's natural route was to become a CEO. Mm -hmm. Now, I have opinions on that. Uh, if, if, I, if I'm in an engineering business, would I prefer to have an engineer running the business? Or would I rather have a, a, a finance person running the business? I'll, I'll open that one up to you back, back in a moment. But the most successful and dynamic CFOs, in my experience, don't stay at the business for very long. Mm. They're not the 25, 35 year people because I feel that they're too ingrained and they get, they get into a comfort zone. They're people that engage with the business and they're people that have got multiple industry experience. That's just my experience. And I know that there are some CFOs who I'm friendly with out there that <laughs> know which side of that fence that they fall into. So don't come and get me. But uh, what, what, what's your opinion on that? I think you're right. I think there's this, you know, I always think the most interesting people in any business are the bridges. Indeed. They're the people who can put one foot in the operations or one foot in on the shop floor and one foot in the C-suite or one foot in the, actually, ideally, three feet, one in the customer's, you know, the customer's world as well. Yes. And if you can bridge those things, then you can bring in a huge amount of value. And I, think, I don't think it's any less true of the CFO. You know, I, I think you, the, the finance role is not going away, particularly for larger organisations, because you're always going to have that stakeholder role. You're always going to have that role with satisfying regulators. You're always going to have those things. But fundamentally, we need someone who's got that depth of understanding of the business and an understanding of, of what makes the business tick and profitable, what makes the customers happy, a, a, a depth of relationship with the stakeholders, but then perhaps the skill set is the one that changes, the core skill set is the one that changes. Maybe it isn't a finance skill set anymore, maybe it is increasingly a data skill set that underpins those things. But wrapped around that, you've got to have that, that sort of empathy almost for the different people that you're engaging with. 
So another statement I hear a lot is that businesses feel that they are data rich, but decision poor. Mm. Okay, that's, that, that's something that you'll hear a lot as well. To put a context on that, therefore, should businesses go out and welcome more data if they value it, or should they just stick with what they've got and get on top of what they've got, or do they just need to have a very expansive view? I, I will tell a story from a client of mine without revealing who it is. But I, I had a client, a very large organisation, that had a lot of difficult questions to answer. And their first step to trying to answer those questions was trying to unify all their data into one coherent whole. Like a data warehouse or a a a traditional route. Or a lake or whatever it may be. But at least trying to sort of get it into one consistent whole. Because they had 150 different core applications. This wasn't an organization that had been acquisitive. This was inside one organization, 150 different core applications, most of which were pre-internet and pre-API. So very little way of getting data out of them. You know I'm trying to think who this is, but I'm going, to let, I'm going to let you go with that one. Go on. <laughs> and, and I said to them, don't. Like, that's a great objective, and it fulfills the natural human desire to put everything in boxes and organise things. But let's start with what questions you're trying to answer. Mm. Start with the questions you're trying to answer, and let's build solutions to answer those questions, but do so in a framework that provides for a long-term whole. And because otherwise, you're going to spend five years trying to get this data set perfect so you can start to interrogate it. And all of those critical business questions are going to have to wait until you've done it. And you can't afford to wait. My practice is predicated on this idea of high frequency change. Not that everything's changing fast now, but that technology has stripped the friction from innovation and competition. And you can't afford to take decisions slowly now because the market will outpace you, will leave you sat on the ground while new entrants and competitors who do grasp those opportunities for accelerated decision making fly past you. And so you need the tools at your disposal to answer those business questions. It's a, if you can, if you've got the time to do that sort of coherent process of pulling all your data together, great, but it should be a long-term objective. Start with the questions you need to answer. Bring in the technology that answers those questions today, and then, but do so in a framework that allows you to, bring, to unify everything in the long term. And I think you raise a great point there, and that's one I can definitely reflect back from my experience, which is traditionally businesses would look at finance transformation as three, five, seven-year behemoth projects. Yeah. They would engage one of the mega vendors. There would be this very much of a waterfall idea of we will do this and then we will do this and there will be a, you know, a raising of value. I'm seeing a lot of companies who have gone down that route, invested very, very large sums of money, and they've not been able to realise the value because the project is longer than effectively the, ch- the change that is going on within the environment around the business. So... I've been seeing a trend towards having the bigger picture, having that journey in mind, but going away from this waterfall approach to a very agile approach, which is, what's my immediate issue? Bang, solve that. What's the next one? And then go and challenge that. And underlying that, though, you don't want to create additional silos of data. Because all you're doing is you're putting a plaster, but you're using a different color plaster every single time and the patient doesn't look very good after a while. <laughs> so, you know, I've got experience of trying to talk to, you know, the Office of Finance of let's sort the data piece. And that, cre- that in itself creates the agility. Yeah. But the data warehouse we're finding is now quite a staid way of doing that. And that actually they should just choose whether to use aggregated data or just focus on areas of the business. So rather than trying to just eat all of the data, yeah. is look at it as, as, as slices. There's a hybrid, look, there's a hybrid approach. There is the massive scale waterfall transformation, you know, that we're going to design it now and it'll be delivered in five years and by the time it's delivered, it's completely out of date. Yes. We've all seen that happen. There is the point solution approach, you know, allowing you know, Fred or Janet with their credit card to go and buy a small piece of software that solves a particular problem they have at that time. Yep. Nightmare, you know, from a from a IT operations point of view. Uh, from, from a, a data, data governance, governance point of view. It's, yes. Absolute nightmare. And then somewhere in the middle, you've got, well, look, here's our data. Most of it's accessible in some way. We can aggregate. We know that there, it's great to have an objective of the long term to bring it all together. And maybe bring the major components together today and then progress the others. But let's find a solution that allows us to answer questions today, 
that sits in you know that that is scalable to the whole organization but comes in at a you know at a price point that says if we want to have these five questions we can so we're thinking about the long term we're thinking about a, an, an organization wide solution both in terms of how our data is brought together and in terms of the software and the skill set we're going to have to do this full sort of xpna piece but we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, reinvent the organization, reinvent all of our processes yes. in order to address these business critical questions because they are critical and they are urgent. And so for me, the, the, most, the most interesting organizations are really realists. They're, they're the ones who go, actually, in five years' time, we're not going to have the political capital to push this project through. Yes. We're not going to have probably the support of users because they're going to get tired of it. And actually, the solution we put in place is probably going to be out of date because we've seen the pace of change of technology the last few years. What we need is a solution that can give us answers today, that's got a roadmap for the future, but that doesn't require us to re-engineer everything in order to get to that position. And that, for me, is a really critical point. So we've touched on we touch on blockchain in the uh, in the ebook. Uh, it's something everybody's heard about. I'm not sure everybody understands what it's about. Uh, we hear about mining, we hear about energy. What's your take? Is, 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 this, is, it, is this a long stay for finance or is this a passing trend? Yeah, I have my scepticism about blockchain as a foundation for currencies. I think that, that energy inefficiency is a big issue. I think actually it's transaction rates an issue as well. There are improvements being made on that, but it's, it's relatively slow. But for me, what's interesting about blockchain is the foundational principles. And mm -hmm. it's something actually the construction industry particularly you know, should be looking at, which is transparency. You know, how can we ensure that information moves quickly, transparently through the supply chain, through the organization, and we don't have to be sort of you know, moving chits of paper around in order to sort of you know, to track those transactions, to track those actions, to track those assets. Yes. That for me is really exciting, and particularly in construction where you do have these this incredible complexity, multiple projects, multiple suppliers, multiple stakeholders, multiple assets, the ability to bring all that down to a single technology platform that, that processes it all and keeps it coherent, that for me is really exciting. Okay, so I'm going to challenge that a bit because then we also have the principle of edge computing, which is the idea very much of having a decentralized processing of data. So if you're on site, is processing data there and then only feeding back and then only centralizing the data that you actually need to. Mm. That strikes me as the pretty much the opposite of blockchain. Is, is, is one better? Is, is, is there a hybrid approach? No, in many ways blockchain is the hybrid approach because it's designed for that sort of decentralized capability and even intermittent connectivity. Not that we're going to have intermittent connectivity when the, the, the UK is bathed in 5G, but you know, if you've got that, you're going to need that edge computing just because you don't want to sort of move the data around unnecessarily. But you're talking about very small packets with something like blockchain, even if it is a, or a variation thereof. You're talking about very small amounts of data moving back and forth. Right. Just to sort of record those transactions, you're not talking about the, the massive sort of file sizes of, you know, sort of an entire set of project plans. So for me, I think, I think you know, edge computing is a critical part of it. You want that responsiveness on site. Um, you don't want to be shifting data around unnecessarily, but you do want the ability to maintain that transparency by shifting at least the information and the metadata about transactions back and forth. So Tom, reading through the ebook, there's a, there's a consistent theme here about change. Mm. Do we embrace change? How do we manage change? The different types of change? How do we push change through? You know, we live in very uncertain times. There's so, everything's getting busier. Data is proliferating. What, 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 what advice are you giving and can you give to finance professionals in general, but also in construction? How can they, how can they embrace this? Should they? How do they deal with all of this? You, the, the simplest piece of advice I give to all my clients is to carve out time to focus on the future. Because we're all so busy, you get sucked into the day-to-day, -day, and it's as true in construction when you're fighting issues with the supply chain as it is in finance, when you're fighting issues with you know, urgent reporting requirements or you know, calls from shareholders, stakeholders. Carve out time to focus on the future. And it doesn't have to be much. You know, I say to every client, carve out 1% of your time to focus on the future one day every six months, where you step out of the business, you get away from the, sort of the distractions, and you do that scenario planning, you do that storytelling, you do that examination of possibilities, and start to look for some of those things that might trip you up next time. And for me, it's about you know, build the 
political capital, build the support to get that time, to get that space, to get that focus. Because we've faced so many disruptive changes over the last couple of years, everyone understands that more could be coming. Yes. Now is the time to go and say, we need to make the investment, we need to make the investment in time, we need to make the investment in technology, so that we can see these things coming. So that when change comes, we are ready for it, not surprised by it. What about you? I mean, you must be dealing with a lot of, of clients who who've sort of facing all sorts of change at the moment. What's your advice that you're giving them? So, I mean, in my experience, the larger projects that have worked out well, it's because I think there's re really core, three core components. The executive sponsorship has to be right, okay? Everybody, has, everybody at the senior level has to be bought in. The communication of what is being done and why. How many times do we see in business, we're going to do this, but the why is sadly lacking. Mm -hmm. um, the messaging and the communication also has to be consistent. So whether that's to operations, whether that's to finance, whether that's to investors or external bodies, it must be honest, it must be transparent, it must be able to be interrogated. It has to, be able to, it has to withstand challenge. And having transparency and honesty through all of this, for me, is, 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 is a crucial sign of success. The other thing is to keep at it. Keep the funding, keep focus. You know, we live in a world that is changing. If something new turns up, something new is always going to turn up. You know, we've had COVID. Wow, everything got turned upside down. But let's look, the ones that were able to change and adapt, but maintain their core business focus, those have been the big winners. Mm. The ones that got turned upside down were the ones that were, they didn't have that spine, so to speak, and they got easily distracted and, um, and they were diverted from, from their core messaging. I think that narrative of change is so important. Yeah. You know, because I talked about finding the time and the technology to actually do the foresight and see what's coming. It's no good if you can't communicate it. Yes. And so be able to take that foresight, take that vision of the future, there is your plan for a change project and what it's going to deliver for all the stakeholders, or if it's a vision of the future and how you're going to change in response to it, it's got to be translated into a clear story that's shared with all the people who are going to benefit from or be affected by that change.